in 2002, just after my finishing up my psychology, um, I wanted to go abroad and so I asked my uncle, who's a good researcher, and he said, go to Niels Bierbaumer in Tübingen and I spent a week there and on the final day of that week um, I had already seen a whole bunch of research and they took me to a locked in patient and was the famous patient HPS mentioned in the Nature paper of 1999 and um, this guy spent about half an hour trying to spell my name Femke on a, with a BCI and that was just so impressive to me that uh, I decided then and there I wanted to uh, go into BCI research. The most pleasant memories probably come from working with the patient, visiting them at home, um, learning a lot about what it is to have disabilities and um, especially what it is uh, to live with disabilities and that you can be quite happy even if you're disabled and, uh, seeing that these people are extremely strong people uh, they can overcome uh, very extreme situations they create their own technologies in a way and they're very interested in BCI technology very innovative open people how I feel about it is that I can understand that uh, the general public would think that. I can also understand doctors think about that. As a scientist, I know, I've researched it quite extensively, um, is that people with disabilities can have a comparable quality of life um, compared to uh, people without disabilities. And even if you go on a ventilator, for example, so you have artificial ventilation, um, these people seem to be um, just as happy as other people and it's quite remarkable and um, so it greatly bothers me that most of the doctors actively disencourage people to go on a ventilator and to let it happen that they die at the end of their disease. I think that's, uh, that's not the correct information to give the patients. It's such a in, uh, counterintuitive finding from science that people who cannot move anymore can still have quality of life. Um, that it's very difficult to convince uh, people to it. So sometimes I don't even believe it that it can be true. I think the best we can do is just mention it as often as we can and um, d include these people into society so they can show themselves that they, are, that they have a lot of value. That credit I have to give to Niels Bierbaumer, um, even though he's notoriously and maybe infamous sometimes, but he's the person I think who knows so much about the brain and, and how, it, how it works. And I really like how he brings all of his research down to Hebbian learning and uh, cells that fire together, wire together. That's really the basic of his research and it, it really applies to, to so many behavior uh, that we see. Right now I hope to accomplish that I um, really start a wave of interest for neuroethics and acceptance of neurotechnologies. I would like to promote that the general public is, is more actively involved in the ethical debate, in the societal, societal debate uh, about neurotechnologies. And I hope I can contribute to that, if I find the funding for it, <laughs> um, by a lot of focus group interviews and a lot of explaining neuroscience to the general public. I think they have already emerged. I think it's the gamers, especially, who are very interested in BCI. I think there is, if there is one thing that connects all the BCI uh, research with, with humans is that the, the participants have a lot of fun trying it out and they really like to see their own brain activity and they start to realize that they have a brain. I mean, you know it, but you don't really reflect on it and that you can influence your own brain activity. I think it's a lot of fun for people, so I think that for gamers, um, BCI applications could be very funny 
and I hope as a spillover that this will reduce the price and will increase the, the research in this area so the, 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 the patients with a disability can also benefit from it. I think uh, non-invasive BCIs mainly, um, a project like Decoder, um, I really like this. I hear from some neurologists that they really would like to have wearable, uh, real-time uh, systems that, that can help them diagnose patients. Um, and invasive I also think is very promising because patients keep telling me that they want invisible systems. It, they don't want to have attention drawn to them. And in that sense, I think the wire should be inside the skull so you can sleep with it, you can have a shower with it. I had a very interesting discussion with somebody who said that the way Europe has been funding projects is not necessarily the way to go about bringing products from science into, um, into real life. Because, he said, you're asking scientists to become uh, business people. So they do all the science and then in the end you ask them to think of a business model and um, they cannot do this very well or not with the, with the kind of funding they're getting. So maybe the European project should be run more like companies where you have real management and also dedicated resources to, to manage the scientist so they can excel at what they do best but somebody else can take that knowledge and bring it to the market. I think maybe we want to see m much more uh, industries within the, the consortia and not just one industrial partner, but maybe half of the industrial partners being industry. Another recommendation that I would like to make is that uh, there should be more than one ethical groups in each consortium to work out this societal acceptance and to make sure that um, that the scientists are developing something from scratch which has the potential to be accepted also by the public. Within the Brain Game project what I hope to achieve is um, first of all to increase BCI awareness in Holland tremendously but also to carry out the, the excellent research of the brain gain into Europe and into the world. So um, I can provide a, a very good network for the brain gain partners at the moment. And their, their research efforts go beyond the next three years and then the project ends. But I want them to continue their research and, and the developments uh, after that. Beside that, I really hope that we can turn some of the knowledge of the Brain Game project. Everything is not possible, but there are some really good pearls in there that I hope we can develop into business ideas. And there's talk about two spin-off companies in the next year, and I'm very proud of that. I'm really hoping it, it goes well. Well, there were many, but I'd like to mention um, uh, one story about a woman uh, we'd been following. She, she was locked in at that time and she was being interviewed for a German uh, documentary. Uh, the journalist uh, were, uh, was already at her house since uh, maybe 15 hours. It takes a lot of time to interview these people. And I noticed that the cameraman was kind of getting a little bit impatient. And so the journalist was asking her what is very important for you to cope with your illness. And she wrote with the BCI, she wrote the word patience, but it was also a hint to the cameraman. Now, a little bit later, the journalist asked her, um, she said, I cannot understand why you chose to be artificially ventilated. And um, with the BCI, um, this woman wrote, life is always exciting, valuable and interesting. And that to me was um, a very, good moment. I see many more students getting enthusiastic about BCI research and they have very innovative ideas 
that um, that I think we should um, we should encourage them. Sometimes um, they also have maybe naive ideas, but I love all of these ideas, and they, I think some of these ideas will bring about innovation and something else that that we never thought of.